next paper in our series on jumping biomechanics and jumping performance is another one on jumping for uh, maximum height in the vertical direction. Uh, this is a 1993 paper by Anderson and Pandy titled Storage and Utilization of Elastic Strain Energy During Jumping. Um, the design of this study is pretty similar to the previous study, the Bobert and Van Soest uh, study, where they used a computer simulation approach to examine uh, strength effects and practice effects on, on vertical jump height. Um, here they were comparing, and so that was on squat jumps. Um, here they simulated both squat jumps and counter movement jumps to examine one of the main uh, theories on why people tend to perform better in counter movement jumps versus uh, squat jumps. One of, the, one of those uh, leading theories is that you store and uh, return or more efficiently return um, elastic strain energy in your muscles and specifically in the tendons of your muscles when you do a, a counter movement jump uh, versus when you do a uh, squat jump. And so here they were examining whether there is a difference um, in how energy is stored and returned in the tendons when people do those two different times of jumps. Um, and uh, then does this necessarily lead to, if, if there is differences there, does it necessarily lead to an increase in uh, jump height when, when you're performing the counter movement um, uh, versus the uh, squat? So they weren't really directly uh, answering the question or, or addressing the question of uh, why counter movement jump height is greater than squat jump height, but we're critically examining one of one of the leading theories on on why it's 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 greater, why there's a difference in performance uh, between those jumps. So it's a good example of, of the general approach that I like to take on sport biomechanics and biomechanics in general, um, beyond just observing that there's a difference between two ways of doing something, um, explaining why there's a difference there. What what are the mechanical underpinnings that that lead to that difference or that explain that difference? That's where things get really interesting and where you can uh, really start to understand what, what's happening at, at various levels of scale. Okay, so they did a computer simulation approach here. Um, the model is shown here in figure one. It's pretty similar to the model uh, used in the previous study where you've got a trunk and a thigh and a shank and a foot, and this was representing both sides of the body symmetrically again. Um, some muscles spanning those joints, in particular the main uh, hip extensors, the glutei and the hamstrings, um, the main knee extensors, uh, the quadriceps, and the main uh, ankle muscles, or the main uh, ankle extensors, the plantar flexors there. Um, they then used uh, optimization, a, a numerical uh, method on computers, to find the uh, excitation signals, the timing and magnitude of excitations for each of those muscles to get the model to jump as high as possible. Um, they had some human subjects come into the lab and uh, also perform uh, counter movement jumps and squat jumps and uh, then compared the, uh, the motion and the control of the muscles in the model when it jumped for max height uh, compared to what the humans did uh, with their joint motions and their uh, muscle uh, excitations via EMG uh, when they jumped for max height. And, and from that, you can, you can kind of browse through the, uh, uh, the figures here where they show the, you know, the joint motions for the two jumps on the left and the right and the, uh, the uh, motion of the center of mass, the, uh, the acceleration and velocity and, and position of the center of mass in the vertical direction and uh, the, uh, the timing of, of the muscle activity here in the last two figures. Um, in all of these panels here, um, the left column is the uh, squat jump, sorry, the counter movement jump, and the uh, right panel here is the uh, squat jump. The thin lines are data measured from 13 human subjects, 13 individuals who did these jumps, and the thick lines are the, uh, the motion of the model, or in the, the center of mass of the model, or in the bottom here, the, uh, the muscle excitations of the model. Um, so if you were to take these uh, figure, these graphs here, these lines, and take the thick line representing the model and turn it into a thin line, you'd have a hard time looking at those 14 curves there and, and picking out the one that's the model. It wouldn't be obvious which one's, you know, the human subjects and which one was, was the model. So, so some pretty good confidence here that the model was moving in a way that was similar to the human subjects and, and controlling its muscles during those movements in a way that was similar to uh, human subjects. Now, that's important because what they were doing here was examining with the model um, something that we can't examine in human subjects. It's a little bit hard to glean from uh, the simple drawings they have here, but each one of these muscle models has a representation of the fibers and a representation of the tendon for that specific muscle. And uh, from the simulation results here, you get the forces and the individual muscle fiber groups, and then the, uh, the, the energy as a result stored and, and uh, returned by the tendon um, when it's performing these motions, in this case, a simulated squat jump and a simulated counter movement jump. Um, in a human, we can't really measure those things, at least uh, not easily. You could go in and attach like, 
uh, strain gauges and use imaging of some sort to sort of measure these things. But certainly in a human, it's not uh, accessible and impractical or impossible some of the time to actually take those measures on, on a live human subject. We can't really easily measure like uh, energy stored and returned in, you know, six or seven different muscles in, in human tendons while they're, while they're performing movements like that. That's just not something we have the uh, technology and, 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 and equipment to do, at least currently, in, uh, in human experiments. So we can use models to, uh, to estimate these things. And if the model moves uh, in a way that's uh, similar to data that we can measure on humans, then we gain some confidence in drawing conclusions on humans from the model-based data that we can't measure on humans, like the, the muscle forces and, and the uh, tendon energy storage in return. Okay. So what did they find here? Um, Key take-home message here is that there was a small difference in the amount of elastic energy stored in your tendons when you do a counter-movement jump than doing a squat jump. It was a little bit higher in the counter-movement versus the squat, but not dramatically higher. Um, there was a, a large difference in the source of that elastic energy, like where it came from, what, what was actually performing the work on the tendon to stretch it and store that energy. Um, but then there wasn't much of a difference in the height that they got to. Actually, in the uh, simulation results here, their uh, uh, counter-movement jump height was actually a little bit lower than their squat jump height, which is, uh, which is unusual, but they, 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 I won't go into the details, but they give some, some pretty plausible explanations here, I would say, why, uh, why they got that result in the model and why, why it's not a big deal, why it doesn't uh, compromise drawing inferences on human jumping where counter-movement jump height is typically greater than squat jump height. Um, so to further explain what happened here and the main ideas, rather than just talk at you over uh, video and, and highlight text and stuff, I'm going to pull up my video. And let's revisit our rubber band friend here, my favorite model of muscle. So think of the rubber band as being like a tendon, and think of my uh, hand here, my left hand, as being like muscle fibers. Right? Um, I take the rubber band and I pull on it with my left hand, I produce a force with my left hand pulling on the rubber band to stretch it. Okay? And when I stretch it, I store strain energy in the rubber band, and then when I release it, that strain energy gets returned as kinetic energy, energy of motion that causes it to, to shoot out of my hand and across the room here. Um, if I pull it with a small force, I stretch it just a little bit, and I let it go, and it moves pretty slowly. Right? If I apply a bigger force to it, I stretch it a lot, I store a lot more strain energy in it, and I let it go, and it shoots out of my hand a lot faster. Okay? So the more that you stretch the rubber band, the more strain energy gets stored in it, and the more kinetic energy you get out of it when you let it go. Okay? Now, think of the rubber band here as a tendon, and think of my hand here as muscle fibers. Okay? My nervous system activates the muscle fibers. They respond by producing a force, they express that force on the tendon, and the more force they produce, the further they stretch the tendon. Okay? The further they stretch it, the more strain energy they store in the tendon, and the more energy you have in the tendon to potentially become kinetic energy or to potentially become work performed on the center of mass to raise it up above, above the ground and to get a high takeoff velocity and, and end up shooting off the ground fast and going uh, high up into the air. Okay? So... Um, differences there, differences in the um, amount of energy stored in tendons in terms of stretching tendons with fiber forces and uh, the return of that energy as uh, kinetic energy and as work done by the tendons on the skeleton raising it up into the air is uh, one of the key theories or has been one of the key theories on why people tend to jump higher when they do a counter movement jump versus a squat jump. Now let's, let's kind of critically examine if there's a strong basis for that idea for storing more energy in the muscles and in the tendons when I do a um, counter movement jump versus when I do a squat jump. So let me try and angle this so that you guys can see most of me here. Okay, so here you can see most of my body. You can especially see my, my three main lower limb joints that were in the model here, my hip and my knee and my ankle. Um, so here in the, uh, in the simulations and in, in the human experiments on human subjects, they were doing a counter movement jump, which has this dynamic squat. And they were doing a uh, squat jump, which has a static squat. Right? Like I, don't, I don't magically just start in a squatic posture. I have to start upright like this, and then I squat down to that posture. But I hold that squat. I hold it statically. Okay? And then after I've been holding it statically, and after I get all my you know, velocities here, 
settled out to zero, then I do my jump. Okay, without a counter movement. Right. So in this particular study, and in, in any, I would say any good study that's trying to compare um, squat jumps and counter movement jumps on kind of like an apples for apples basis, um, the depth of those squats should be the same. And ideally the, the, the specific angles of the joints that you use to get to those depths should be the same or very similar, right? So like when I'm doing my counter movement jump, you can see that I get to a certain depth here when I squat down and counter back up, okay? So I, I deliberately didn't go very deep there. If you were then gonna compare that to a squat jump where like I start way down here and then do my jump, that's not a very good comparison, right? Because those, those squats differed by a lot. Um, a better comparison would be, do your counter movement jump, okay? And then do your squat jump, but start from squatting to that same depth, okay? And ideally start with like the same combination of joint angles leading to that squat depth, hold that, and then do your squat jump. So that was exactly what they did in this study. Um, the subjects and the model that they simulated jumps with had to squat to the same depth with about the same hip, knee, and ankle angles in both types of jumps. Okay, if you squatted down to this depth for your counter movement jump, you also had to squat down to that depth for your squat jump. There couldn't be a, a large difference in the squat depths there. And for the simulations, for the, for the model, they're able to make those things exactly the same, right? It had the exact same uh, squat depth and the exact same uh, angles of the hip and the knee and the ankle um, for those those positions there. Okay. Now that's important. Sorry, I lost my video for a second. Um, that's important because remember from a lecture or two ago, the angles of my joints affects the length of my muscles, this current stretch in my muscles, which will affect the amount of elastic energy stored in those muscles, right? Um, like for my knee here, my quadriceps span the top of my knee, and my hamstrings span the bottom of my knee. Okay. Um, the more that I extend my knee, because my hamstrings go under my knee here, and I attach onto my, my shank there, you can see one of my hamstring tendons there. Um, the more that I extend the knee, the more I stretch the hamstrings, the longer the hamstrings get, and the shorter the quadriceps get. Okay. Then in the other direction, if I flex the knee, the more I flex the longer the quadriceps get and the shorter the hamstrings get. And it's not just for the knee, like if I do it for my, uh, for my ankle too here, the further that I dorsiflex the ankle, the shorter my dorsiflexors get and the longer my plantar flexors get. Then in the other direction, the more that I plantar flex the ankle, the longer my dorsiflexors get and the shorter my plantar flexors get. So long story short, the the angles of the joints, the positions of the joints, affects the length of the muscles spanning those joints, the stretch in the muscles spanning those joints, and hence the, the energy, the elastic energy stored as, as strain energy in those muscles. So if you're squatting down to the same depth in your counter movement as you are in your squat jump, then you're stretching the muscles to about the same length and storing about the same elastic energy in them. Okay, so there's not really a, a compelling reason there, especially if you're matching those things, to expect there to be a lot more strain energy stored uh, in the muscles as a whole um, in, when I do the counter movement. Now, I wanna emphasize that that's for like the whole muscle, you know, like the, the fibers plus the tendon, you know, the entire structure, so not just the tendon. Um, so like the length there that we would be referring to in terms of whole muscle length, if I go back to my model here, would be like the length of the fibers plus the length of the tendon. Okay? So I can't, from that argument on, on, uh, on squat depth, really say anything specific about the energy stored in the tendon. It's still possible you might store a little bit more energy in the tendon specifically when doing the counter movement, but you're definitely not storing, at least if, if the, the squat depths and angles are similar, you're uh, not storing more uh, energy in the whole muscle or appreciably more energy in the whole muscle by uh, doing a counter movement versus doing a, a squat jump. Now, what you might be doing to store more energy in the tendon is taking advantage of one really important factor that affects how much force muscle fibers produce, and that's this force velocity relationship. Um, what I have shown here is a simple model of muscle force where
Uh, F is the amount of force a, a, a group of muscle fibers is currently producing. And that's going to be equal to four things here multiplied together. F max times act times FL times FB. And what is all this? Um, like I said, F is the actual force the muscle fibers are producing that gets expressed on the tendon and stretches the tendon and stores energy in it. Um, F max is the maximum isometric force of the muscle. This is the amount of force the muscle fiber would produce if it's maximally activated at its optimal length and at zero velocity. Okay. Um, act here is the muscle activation level. This is uh, uh, the uh, activation level resulting from the nervous system act asking the muscle to produce force. And it'll be some factor that ranges from zero to one or zero to 100% activated. And then FL and FV here. Um, we've talked about those before, but let's, let's revisit them here. Um, FL is the force length factor and FV is the force velocity factor. Um, FL, force length, varies from zero to one and it graphically looks like this blue line here, meaning there's a certain length of uh, muscle, certain length of muscle fibers, specifically in this case, at which the muscle fiber produces its largest possible force. Okay? If you stretch it to a longer length, it produces less force for a given activation level. And if you shorten it to a shorter length, it produces less force. Okay, so some, some length here in the, typically in the middle of the feasible lengths of the muscle fiber at which it can produce its most force. Um, that's not all that important for us because, again, remember, we're, we're squatting down to the same depth here. So muscle lengths here, not necessarily fiber lengths, but a whole muscle lengths here are going to be roughly the same if the, the squat depth is the same between our two jumps. Um, what is different is this force velocity relationship here. What could be different is this force velocity relationship here. Right? Um, force velocity varies from about zero to one. Um, its value here, so you'd be multiplying this whole thing by zero and producing no force. Um, that would be when you're on the right side, the far right side of this force velocity curve, um, corresponding to a situation where you are contracting the muscle fiber very fast or shortening the muscle fiber very quickly. Um, the vertical dashed line here is an isometric case where the muscle velocity is zero and uh, FV here, the FV uh, factor here in this equation would have a value of one, okay, corresponding to an isometric case when the muscle's uh, velocity is zero. It's not shortening, it's not lengthening, it's just staying at its current length. Um, the faster that you shorten the muscle relative to zero velocity, the less force it can produce up, up to a condition where if you contract it really, really fast, if you contract it at a certain speed that's, that's, that's very fast typically, it actually can't produce any force, even if you're maximally activating it. Um, things get interesting though if we go in the other direction, if instead of shortening the muscle, we lengthen the muscle. Okay, and that would be on the, the, uh, the data on the, the red line here on the left hand side of this vertical isometric uh, line. So on the left hand side here would be a case where not, the muscle's not shortening, the muscle's actually lengthening, or we're actively stretching it. Okay? And at least up to a, a certain limit, the faster that you lengthen a muscle, the faster that you actively stretch a muscle, the more force it can produce above its max isometric force. Okay. So more force in the, in the muscle fibers, uh, larger force um, expressed on the tendon, uh, possibly uh, stretching the tendon more and, and, and stretching it with a larger force and storing, uh, performing more work on the tendon from the muscle fibers and uh, storing more elastic strain energy in, in the tendon from, from that larger force um, expressed on it uh, by the muscle fibers due to this force velocity relationship. Now, is that happening when I do a counter movement jump? I would argue that it could be. Okay. So I'll illustrate one more um, difference here. between counter movement jump and squat jump. And it's not the depth of the squat, it's the speed at which my body's moving while I'm doing the squat. Okay. So in my squat jump, I start up here and then I squat down and then I just hold things there, right? So right now, as I'm just squatted here statically, my center of mass velocity is zero, my joint angle velocities are zero, my muscle lengths are not changing, my muscle fibers aren't changing lengths, my tendons aren't changing lengths, everything's just static as I hold this squat here. Okay? So my muscle force velocity factor right now is equal to one, right? It's not consent, the muscles aren't shortening, the muscles aren't lengthening, they're at an isometric uh, length right now. Okay? Compare that to if I do a counter movement where I start up right and then I squat down like this. 
when I'm in the act of squatting down, as I flex my hip here, I'm extending or I'm stretching my glutes, I'm flexing my knee and stretching my quadriceps, and I'm flexing my ankle and stretching my calf muscle, stretching my plantar flexors. Okay? So I'm stretching all three of those big, strong extensor muscle groups that are gonna push me into the air when I get to the bottom of my squat. As I'm stretching them like that, I'm pulling them up onto that eccentric half or that eccentric side of their force velocity curve where they can produce more force than if I was just statically holding this squat here like this. So one of the results that they, that they found here, if I go back to the text of the paper, if I just go up to the abstract here, this, this paper has a great abstract. It's a really uh, concise summary of all the main key elements and findings of the paper. You should always read the full text of the paper. Don't just read the abstract, but this is a really good abstract. Um, they say they found here that they say nearly as much elastic strain energy was stored in the squat jump or the counter movement jump. Nearly as much, meaning they did indeed store a little bit more elastic strain energy in the tendons in the counter movement jump. Um, why is that? I would speculate that it's because the muscles were being stretched or the muscle fibers were being stretched during the counter movement, stretched dynamically up onto the eccentric part of their, their force velocity curve, producing more force and then performing more work uh, from the muscle fibers on the tendons and stretching them more and more elastic strain energy in those tendons. Um, compared to the squat jump where you're just statically squatting there, uh, the force velocity factor is one, it's isometric and it's uh, performing or producing less force uh, pop, or at least possibly producing less force than it was during the counter movement jump and storing uh, less energy in the tendons. Okay. But there really wasn't a large difference there. So that's in theory something that, that could possibly result in more uh, energy stored in the counter movement jump for the tendons, but it wasn't something that at least in this study they deemed to be a, a major result. They said they were nearly the same, not exactly the same, but nearly the same. Um, where they did see more of a difference um, also relates to what I just demonstrated there. Um, but in kind of a, a different direction. They're different uh, sources of where the energy stored in the tendons came from in the first place. And they highlight that down here. They say, um, during the counter movement jump, strain energy stored in elastic tissues, primarily tendons, um, came primarily from gravitational potential energy of the skeleton. Okay, so keep that in mind. Gravitational potential energy of the skeleton uh, storing energy in the tendons. And then they say in the squat jump, on the other hand, energy stored in the elastic tissues came primarily from the contractile elements as they did work to stretch the tendons in the series elastic elements. Now, what's all this element business? Um, a contractile element, at least in this framework for muscles, is like a muscle fiber. It's the part of muscle that produces uh, active forces in response to the nervous system asking the muscle to produce force. Okay. Um, series elastic elements, these are uh, parts of muscle that respond to that contractile element force, that muscle fiber force, by lengthening, by stretching like a rubber band. So they, 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 they partitioned them out from tendons here, but really these are things that are like uh, tendons, parts of the muscle that uh, are, are connected in series to the muscle fibers and respond to forces from the muscle fibers by stretching like a rubber band and storing elastic strain energy. So that was kind of a wordy explanation, but what they're saying here is that in the counter movement jump, um, gravity, resulted in stretching of the tendons and storing of strain energy in the tendons. In the squat jump, the source of that stretch in the tendons and the source of that strain energy stored in the tendons was from the muscle fibers themselves, not from gravity. And that makes sense if I go back to my video here for the last time, at least for today. So when I do my squat, or my squat jump, I'm starting up here and then I'm squatting down into my squat, and then I'm statically holding this squat. I'm resisting gravity, right? I'm working against gravity right now. If I were to stop working against gravity, if I were to turn my muscles off, I would just fall into the ground, right? So right now, I'm holding this static squat. I'm producing force in my muscles. Um, that force is stretching the tendons of my muscles. My force in my quadriceps is stressing or stretching the, the patellar tendon right now as, as we speak, as you're watching me do this. Um, but all of that energy stored in my stretch in my patellar tendon right now is coming from the forces produced by my quadriceps muscle fibers up here right now. Okay? Um, if I were to stop producing that force, then I would just fall into the ground under gravity. Okay? So in this static squat, not just for the quadriceps, for all my muscles here, at least all the main uh, 
uh, muscle groups that we think are important for jumping, the glutes, the uh, hamstrings, the hip, or the uh, quadriceps, the plantar flexors. Um, right now, those muscles are producing forces and they are stretching the tendons connected to their muscle fibers, but pretty much all of the energy stored in those uh, tendons by stretching them is coming from the forces produced by those muscle fibers. Okay. Whew, gotta catch my breath. That was difficult. <laughs> um, when I do the counter movement, I have another source of energy that is contributing to the stretch in those tendons and the energy stored in them. Um, as an example, if I start upright like this, then what happens if I just turn off all my muscles right now? What do I do? I go into my squat, right? Um, eventually, I have to turn on my extensor muscles to arrest that motion, right? If I just turn them all off, then I'll just, you know, crumple into the ground. But if I turn them off instantaneously, and then gravity pulls me into the ground, then I get into my squat, and then as I'm on my way down, then I can fire up my muscles to eventually arrest that motion and push me back up into the air. So while I'm deactivating my muscles at the start here to get down dynamically into that squat, yeah, my muscles are still a little bit active and are still uh, producing some force that's stretching the tendon, but the tendons are also being stretched by gravity. They're being stretched by the potential energy from gravity decreasing and becoming kinetic energy that's accelerating me downward and flexing these joints and stretching those muscles and stretching those tendons. Okay. So, sorry, another kind of wordy explanation, but long story short, in the squat jump, pretty much all of the energy that's stored in the tendon at the peak depth of the squat is coming directly from the muscle fibers. And you can see by me needing to, to catch my breath there, that that's kind of an effortful thing if you have to hold it for a little while. Um, in the counter movement jump, you are still um, stretching the tendons with your, your muscle fiber forces directly with the work done on the tendon by the muscle fiber, but you're also stretching the tendon uh, from uh, gravitational potential energy, from gravity uh, doing work on the body to accelerate it downward and move it downward and, and stretch the tendons as a result of that. Okay? And so that's what they're getting at here um, in the abstract when they talk about um, the efficiency of jumping. Um, they, they actually found here in the model that there, there wasn't a difference in jump height for counter movement and squat jump, which is a little unusual. They offer some explanations uh, on why that was the case in their model and why it's not a big deal in terms of uh, drawing inferences on real human jumping where we tend to see uh, people jump higher uh, with the counter movement jump. But here the, here the model actually uh, jumped a tiny bit higher with the squat jump rather than the counter movement. But they make some arguments on why, uh, why that's not a big deal. Um, but what they found here was that the counter movement jump didn't necessarily improve jumping performance, like you didn't necessarily jump higher with all these differences we've just talked about in energy storage and utilization, but it did change the efficiency of jumping. It changed um, how much work your muscle fibers needed to do in order to um, jump to a certain height, right? So the counter movement jump, uh, at least in their model here, didn't necessarily jump higher, but it did do the jump more efficiently. The muscle fibers didn't have to do as much work to jump to a certain height because gravity, the potential energy from gravity, was also contributing to that initial storage of, uh, of energy in, in the tendons. Okay. So counter movement jump, at least based on uh, this theory of energy storage and utilization, not the most compelling theory in the world for why counter movement jump tends to be higher, but could be a compelling theory on counter movement jump height uh, or counter kind of movement jump being easier or being more efficient, right? Maybe this is why if we ask people to, to jump, most people tend to do a counter movement jump because it might perform better, but it also is typically the easier thing to do, the more efficient way of, of jumping to, to a particular height or maybe even jumping to your max height. Um, why is counter kind of movement jump height higher than if it's not due to energy storage and utilization? Um, they don't really directly address that here, but I'll give you kind of a preview that we will talk about later. Um, down on... Where is it? I think it's page four of their results, the last paragraph of, of the fourth page. Um, here where they're describing the time of ground contact. So how much time the model or the subjects spent on the ground doing these different jumps. They say the model took about one second to leave the ground when it did a counter movement. So it spent about one second on the ground to do the counter movement uh, versus about half a second, 0.45 seconds for doing the squat jump. And similar result here for the human subjects. When they did the counter movement jump, took them about one second of time spent on the ground. When they did the squat jump, took them about half a second of time spent on the ground. 
So even though it seems like you might be trying to minimize time taken on the ground, if you've had anyone coach you to jump, they might have taught you to like do the movement fast, like do, do, do the movement explosively. You might think, well, I want to minimize time on the ground, right? That's how I jump high. Um, in the counter movement jump, where people tend to jump higher, they spend about twice as much time on the ground as they do in the squat jump. Okay? So I'll leave you that there for now to, to ponder, because this is getting to be kind of a long video. But that is, I think, a key reason why most people jump higher with the counter movement jump. They don't spend less time on the ground, they spend more time on the ground. So th think about why that might be. Why might spending more time on the ground uh, be beneficial for jumping higher? Okay? And we will revisit that in the next video.